third Wednesday webinar session of Business Technology Forum on Governance and Structure Flexibility. Uh, this session today is uh, in a particular a dedicus to our uh, univer higher education community. So King's College London is joining us here today, as well as uh, all the university and then our implementation partners, Sophigate and Xonetic. We started this uh, webinar series in, the, in March uh, when we represented the entire uh, what's new in the version 4.5 of uh, business technology standard, the set of best practices that's been developed all in the course of over 10 years uh, with uh, dozens of, uh, of partners. And uh, today at this session, we will start with an overview and introduction to the BT standard uh, version 4.5 uh, with the founder of business technology forum, Juha Huovinen, who has joined us today. And uh, then uh, during the afternoon, we will hear very practical insights into how uh, the business technology standard can, can be utilized for assessing the maturity of your organization or how it actually enables uh, structured flexibility. Then we will also hear uh, examples uh, from uh, uh, King's College uh, London's John Butterworth and uh, uh, Aalto University's Elena Pirinen on their experiences related to governance, the roles, and then the structured flexibility from project's point of view. Uh, but I want to still warm, warmly welcome you everyone now that you're dropping in, dropping in little by little to this afternoon session. So for the next two hours, this, uh, this will be our program. My name is Lotta Koskimies and uh, I will be facilitating this session. Uh, I've been with the Business Technology Forum for uh, seven years or so as the partnership uh, liaison officer and also uh, taking part in the development work and uh, community activities. So if this is the first Wednesday webinar, webinar that you'll be attending, uh, warm welcome to you. Or if you have already attended the previous sessions, previous sessions uh, as well, then I'm sure that this will bring new insights for you. And uh, but without further ado, actually welcome Juha Huovin and good that you could join us this afternoon. Thank you, Lotta, and hello everyone. You have a very nice summery shirt there, actually. I yeah, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> summertime in Finland. <laughs> it is summertime, so 12 degrees and raining. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect working time, no problem. Yes, but. Maybe you would like to walk us through a little bit of uh, this area of governance and structured flexibility and what does that actually mean in this uh, version 4.5 and uh, what the general insight as the founding father of the business technology standard you would like, uh, like to bring here at this session. Yeah, thank you a lot. So maybe I very briefly explain what is a business technology standard and uh, so what are the key elements in, in that one. So if you go to the next slide, so hope we will have the one slide on that one. So, so this is the one slider of uh, of business technology standards. So, it's really it's uh, it's it's the open operating model best practice. So, it's it's really it's a business value driven and it's people centric uh, operating model on top of the best practices. So, so that's the great with business technology standard that you can. Uh, you can use a uh, business technology standard on top of ITIL, SAFE, uh, COVID, uh, you name it. So, so in that sense, it's a, it's a consistent and compact, but still it's, it's, a, it's an operating model level best practice on, on top of the uh, expert level best practices. So uh, business technology standard uh, really implements the value streams. It has a, has a great focus on roles, uh, so we have a unified roles uh, throughout all the aspects of, of the operating model. Uh, one of the latest additions is, is really the data. Uh, so we have the technology and data within the same model and, and, and then the minimum viable governance uh, uh, when the business technology standard is so uh, well known. Uh, so it's, it combines uh, the, the speed and agility with the control and, uh, and that's what we talk to get today as well. So uh, Ayla will explain you in a more detailed level 
how to how to build the structured uh, governance. But I will I will reveal uh, some of the basic elements during the, my presentation as well. Uh, you can see the journey. Actually, we started some ten years ago already, uh, so it has evolved. Uh, uh, through these years, and uh, and and now the business technology standard is really recognized as the, uh, let's say, the, the best operating model uh, framework, and and I'm really proud of these principles what are behind this uh, this model. So so it's really open source uh, model. So so you can go to the website. You you can you can use the material uh, in your organizations. No problem with that one. So it's it's really open source. It's also co-created with the community. Uh, so, so whenever we develop something on the model, uh, we always engage uh, uh, some community members and, and then we develop that further by using real and concrete, uh, let's say business challenges and needs. And, um, and uh, that's how we really make sure that the, the model is, is really uh, concrete and it's really uh, let's say talking about the, the topics which we face in our organizations. So we have a very large community with whom we have developed uh, uh, the model further. So, so they are mainly, they are uh, Nordic and, and UK organizations which has contributed on the development of this model. Uh, then the third one, which I'd like to uh, highlight as well is the, the ethical use of the model and then really the business model as well. Uh, the idea behind the model is really to help uh, organizations to utilize the model in the best possible way. So this model and the business model behind has not been optimized for some kind of training purposes or training business. Uh, we really provide uh, the model with an open source principles. Uh, the only thing we, we ask you to, you to have is, uh, is a certain level of knowledge actually to apply the model in your organization. And, and that's why we have organized uh, uh, several uh, uh, training courses uh, helping you to design your, your operating model for your organization. And, uh, and, and, and then the last one, it's, it's really uh, pragmatic as well. So the model really goes uh, uh, from the high level uh, all the way through flows to the templates and even on the, on the tool side. Uh, so, so we have, for example, our partners like Sophicate has a service now implementation on, on, on business technology standard. So that's a business technology standard in a, in a nutshell. And, uh, and today we have uh, uh, attendees enrolling from, uh, from Ireland, from UK and from Finland. But uh, isn't it so, Juha, that, uh, that we have uh, thousands of new downloads of this uh, BT standard from practically from which countries, from all over the globe or what oh, I'm Yeah, yeah, over, over, over 100 countries. So, yeah. So, yeah, so, so it's really popular and, and we don't even know how widely it is used because it's really open. So, so you don't have to, you don't have to leave your, your, your contact information. You can just start uh, using the model itself. Uh, I, I think we ask something when we, when you download uh, the PDF version, but, the, but of course the same uh, material is available in the web without any, any registration. So, so in that sense, it's really free to use. Yes, yes it is. So then we move forward, yes? Yeah, let's go forward. And, and, um, and uh, uh, one, uh, one example how the uh, business technology standard uh, complements the other best practices is the PT standard plus uh, SAFE. Uh, so, so most of you, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's, that has studied uh, whether and thinking whether to use and go to the SAFE uh, because it's really good uh, uh, practice for, for development, especially for software development. Uh, but what we have found that many organizations has uh, some challenges actually to apply the SAFE uh, in their organizations, because SAFE has, has been uh, originally developed for software development. And it really assumed that your whole business is software development. And that's why uh, many organizations are facing some challenges actually to apply the SAFE on, uh, on, 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 on some other businesses where the IT and digitalization is enabling this as not the business itself. 
And that's why um, many organizations actually start their journey to, to agility by using the business technology standard uh, because it's compliant with the SAFE, uh, but the terminology is, uh, is simple. And uh, at the same time, it's also compliant with other best practices which SAFE is not, like the uh, COPIT, ITIL, uh, SIAM, and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and some other uh, best practices. And it also recognizes uh, the, let's say, what the organizations are used to do, like the projects, projects are still valid, uh, and, um, and, and, and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a more compact, but, but at the same time more comprehensive, and it's easier to deploy on, uh, on, on, on any organization. Is it private or public? Is it big or small? Is it focused on, on, on software, or is it uh, uh, focused on something else like, uh, like uh, uh, human services or whatsoever. So this is one example. And, and when we go to the, uh, the presentations uh, today, Ayla will explain you how to actually combine these two elements together. So how the PT standard uh, and, and the SAFE uh, uh, will be applied and, and put together. Uh, maybe the next one, and, and this, this will be my, my last slide in my brief introduction over here is about the minimum viable governance. Uh, so the minimum viable governance has been achieved uh, uh, by introducing three levels of, of governance. Uh, the highest level is the enterprise. So, so that's, uh, that's covering uh, your, your full organization. It, it will be the whole, uh, let's say, higher education uh, you represent over here or, or a company or whatsoever. Uh, then in the middle, we have the value stream. So value stream is more focused on a certain topic. Uh, it, it could be a customer experience could be one value stream, or it could be your, your business lines. But anyhow, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a portfolio of, of development initiatives. And the development initiatives and the development flows are the, the third uh, uh, layer over here. So that's where we have the three alternatives in, uh, in business technology standard. So you can do as a project. So that's where you can see the project manager. So that's where you have the study planning, uh, 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 design, uh, development and, and validation. And then it goes to release and then it goes to production. And, and, and same applies for agile development, uh, a scrum based uh, development where you have scrum master. So that's in the middle. Uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the lower part of this uh, presentation. And then the last one is uh, change request-based uh, management, which is that uh, maintenance uh, of, of your current and existing systems. And they all go uh, to the production on the right-hand side. So, so, so those have a three levels. And, uh, and then over here, we see the hammers over here, uh, which starts with the authorized uh, flow, and, uh, and, and that's the unified uh, governance on top of all those uh, uh, development flows. And that's what Ayla will explain today, how to do that one. And, uh, and that will provide you the minimum viable governance elements. So you let the end-to-end -end flows uh, to go as smoothly as possible. We have the clearly defined roles. And then and, and, and once you need a certain resource or decision and then you go up on the value stream level to ask that one and then the highest level, the enterprise level is providing uh, the guidelines and it's allocating the resources, uh, uh, let's say financial resources for the value streams, which allocate them for the end-to-end -end flows. So this is, a, uh, this is um, um, a quite busy picture you can find on a the, on the public website, but that, that's explained in the website and it's uh, it's explaining the three levels of governance. And uh, uh, continuing to this uh, introduction, uh, Juha, that you are making, uh, we will also hear more uh, in a practical sense what the value streams are are about Very because cute. we will hear yeah. from uh, John Butterworth from King's College London how they have approached to that, that thinking. So that is something yeah. to look forward to as well. And that's always very interesting because uh, this uh, same model uh, is, is always applied. But what are the value streams? They are, they are really organization dependent. And, and I'm really keen to see what uh, uh, King's College London has, has uh, decided to be their value streams. Yes, so am I. 
But maybe next, uh, you, ha uh, you have come to the, to the end of this uh, brief introduction, but you will still uh, stay with us for the, for the next part, because uh, then, of course, in any organization, when, uh, when we start to think about building a development roadmap uh, for uh, improving our operations or for taking the next level or for implementing uh, uh, minimum viable governance or any other uh, change uh, like that, uh, we need to understand where we are at. And uh, this is the reason that uh, we have also invited uh, Nick Russell from Xanetic today to join us and uh, to share uh, how we could go about utilizing the business technology standard in uh, assessing the maturity of, uh, of an IT organization. So Nick, uh, warm welcome to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, good good thing that you could join us. Is it as a summary in the in the UK as it is in Finland today? Uh, it feels more like April showers than May. Oh, yes, not like a end of <laughs> end of May weather yet. Yeah, we haven't we're waiting for summer to start one day. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, UK and Finland are similar in that sense that we can always count on the on the weather. We can always count on the weather to <laughs> yeah to upstage us. <laughs> so, but you can I quit the quit the shares or you can start the start the share so, and we can have a look at uh, how to utilize the BT standard for conduct conducting a maturity assessment. But first, of course, since you are a business technology forums. Uh, implementation partner uh, there in the UK. Maybe you can lead us in a little bit on what's what's happening there in the UK since uh, you've been uh, advancing the BT standard uh, there from for a year or so. Yeah, you see that now, right? Hopefully. Yes, yes, yes. We can see the presentation just uh, just perfectly. Yeah. So I guess in the UK we've been here for a little while now, for maybe uh, maybe three or almost four years in total, I think talking about the business technology standard, but it was only really in October that we started to talk, um, I guess, in a serious, in a seriously and more coordinated way to the, uh, to the higher education um, community, and specifically university community within the UK and Ireland. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's been been a fantastic journey so far we've had we've had you know an enormous amount of interest um, and you can see here from the slide we we have um, we have spoken to a lot of institutions I think the number is higher than than I show here but that was the ones I I, I, I could put my put my hands on yesterday when I was looking at the stats and uh, you know we've really been facilitated by both King's College London who you'll hear talking a bit later who have been a sort of real real leader in the community here in the UK and also USISA which is the community uh, university body which has really helped us access the university uh, university community and helped us build a community of practice as it's called within USISA so that has really opened up um, people's eyes and ears to the fact that the business technology standard exists and uh, we you know we've had a lot of fun talking about the various aspects of that. So, so it's, been, maybe, uh, it's been good. And maybe to put all our attendees on the map, uh, here we have, of course, the map, uh, the local map from uh, Nick's point of view there in the uh, UK and Ireland. But this, this has you know, been a big change in that sense that a couple of years ago, um, all the development partners for the Business Technology Forum for uh, private or public sector organizations, but the university sector, the higher education sector, that has been a completely new opening. And we have been really thrilled about that at the, at the Business Technology Forum. And that is then uh, also uh, Xonetic's role to advance this uh, with USISA in the UK and Ireland. Thanks, Lotta. I think one of the great things about the, the university um, community is it fits really well with the way we think about business technology, the kind of community approach and sharing of knowledge and those those things. So that that chimes really well with the uh, with this community as well. So that's a good thing. I'm going to move on to to. Um, I'm going to try and move on. <laughs> what one of the things we've talked about, obviously, a lot with a, a whole load of new uh, 
organizations that have never heard of business technology before like the sound of it, but really start to wonder, how do I get started? Um, where do I start? How long does it take? Um, what, does a, what does a typical journey look like? And of course, there is no such thing as a typical journey. And the, the standard doesn't prescribe exactly how you should start and finish. It, it makes more sense to, to build a path that fits the needs of your own organization. Um, but we do generally see uh, kind of phase phases that an organisation will go through, and these are the, some of the things that we've been talking a lot in the university forums within the UK. How do we get started? Um, I think one of the things that is a it is maybe an obvious thing, but the where the standard really helps is creating a common language um, to allow different organisations who are perhaps at different levels of maturity or different size, different scale. There's a broad range of scale of organisations within the sector as well. Um, having a common language to be able to communicate um, is really brilliant. Um, and it's, it's, it's moving us towards our eventual goal, which is can we find a way to assess the whole industry and have a view from an industry perspective where, where are we and, and where can we where can we tailor help to to that helps the industry itself as, as well as individual institutions, which I think then takes us to um, the idea of creating a maturity assessment or building a maturity assessment, um, which is specific for the, the university sector. But to be honest, once we, once we go through that process, it, this knowledge will come back into the standard and will be, be available for everybody. And I, and I guess there'll be a lot of uh, crossover crossover learnings that would be useful for for all organizations so just moving on thinking about how we may take forward a, a, um, a maturity assessment we thought it might be quite fun to do an exercise with everybody lots i know you've uh, you've planned you've planned an approach here so i'll let you lead us through this <laughs> yes Actually, Paul is distracting me there in the in the chat because Paul Reardon from uh, Ireland is commenting that in Dublin it's perfectly sunny, so we should all fly over there <laughs> once once we can. <laughs> I hope Paul, you can send a bit of sunshine to other locations as well, if if possible. But uh, but yes, thanks thanks Nick. And this is uh, this is the capability model from the business technology standard, and I believe that uh, it is the most familiar uh, hand like picture to anyone who's been who's been familiarizing themselves with uh, the business technology standard and uh, when we think about this uh, maturity assessment uh, topic that uh, Nick Russell as the CEO for uh, Xonetic is uh, introducing us uh, to uh, this is a very practical uh, step that anyone can take individually or with the support of an implementation partner if they choose to so uh, say we were in a uh, meeting room having a workshop together or uh, over teams uh, doing a workshop, we could uh, as a uh, team of uh, IT or IT and the business together, we could start off with this capability model and we could walk it through together and start evaluating which of these capability areas are in sh uh, good shape in our organization and uh, which areas are most in need of, uh, of improvement. So we could, uh, we could do that, um, uh, that for example, uh, through placing um, stamp marks on this, uh, on this board, or then, uh, you know, commenting and putting, I'm now demonstrating here a little bit, not sure if you can see, see the dots that I'm leaving here, but, um, um, but maybe here, since we are all together, uh, to help Nick uh, demonstrate how we would take it from there after we had assessed together and discovered, for example, which of these uh, capability areas in our organization are the ones that, for example, IT thinks are in need of development or that IT thinks that uh, are in good shape, or then maybe then the uh, substance side, the business side uh, thinks uh, alike or in a different manner and we would open a dialogue together on these different areas so how we would take it from there but uh, maybe here i'd be interested to know 
how uh, how our attendees for today would approach this. If you think about, say, uh, the strategic planning and uh, uh, prioritization, commitment and backlog uh, capability areas, or the financial planning and control, or the business value realization. So maybe uh, we could uh, open up a poll here and ask our attendees how you would assess those. So which one would you say of the following areas is in most uh, in need of improvement in your organization? And then we can take it from there with Nick and see how we would then approach that with the BT standard. So now you should all see a poll there and uh, you can uh, choose, your, choose your answer and then, uh, and then uh, vote what you think is most in need. And then maybe our our uh, moderator there, Maxine, can you share the poll results? Because actually I don't see them here now. So maybe you can, uh, yes, thank you. Excellent. So Nick, uh, can you see them here as well now, the poll results? You are, you are muted for the moment, so maybe. I just grabbed it in case it vanishes. Yes. So we have there the highest highest red is prioritization, commitment, and backlog, and uh, that had uh, forty two percent of the votes of being most in need of improvement in uh, in the attending organizations. And then uh, second is the business value realization. So conveniently, topics that are very very relevant in terms of the themes uh, that we have present here today. Yeah, that's um, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it's a common um, area where we we often spend a lot of discussion. I think so. Maybe we'll jump to the next slide, and I can, I can show some more detail around that. Yeah. So if we assume then that this would be the result that we got from uh, a given organisation that we were doing this. Uh, as first step of the assessment together. And now we had everybody's viewpoint and those would come up and then, then we uh, take it from here. So how could we proceed then? I'm gonna move on. Yes. Can you see the next slide, right? Moving. Sorry, I clicked and nothing happened. So I was just I was momentarily- <laughs> Yes, it was a bit slow, there, no worries. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I think, I think you can. There's two things that you can take out of the that type of very very rapid assessment. One is obviously each of the capability tiles themselves um, are a, are a discipline that, in its own right, you can one can spend time on improving and understanding better. Um, and I think that's one that's one activity. But I think once you start to link the hotspots together you then start to see a pattern and the patterns are what are, what are super, super interesting. Um, and the one I've drawn here is one that I see <laughs> fairly frequently. And interestingly, I've, I've, I've picked the two, two, two of the uh, tiles that were, came out the top in the poll we just did, which was the prioritization and, and business um, value realization. I think when you think about the flow of how do I go from having an idea in an organization, figuring out how I prioritize all of that work, get it into a machine that, that delivers that work, and then how do I measure whether I was effective? I think that's probably the, the most important flow in terms of the, a lot of the thinking behind business technology. So it, it's one that commonly, commonly comes up. Um, so, I don't know whether there's anyone on the call that kind of the, the, the ways I've talked about this manifesting itself, maybe people are thinking that, that that's something they've seen before or maybe not, I don't know. Um, but that is, it's, it's a common outcome. And this is, this is when um, understanding that that is the flow that you, that perhaps is the place to start, um, that's the real value of doing a, doing a maturity assessment. I think ultimately knowing where you are is one thing, but then 
knowing how you move forwards and and what the right approach is to move forwards that's that's really where you can then start to rely and lean on the standard to to show you thinking that other companies before you have done in order to figure out some of these problems um you i don't know if you want to jump in and add anything here I was just about to just about to also address you uh, because I know that, for example, uh, King's College London and then uh, also all the universities, they have um, uh, tried out this uh, approach and uh, that it has helped understand uh, where to take it from there. And then uh, maybe you if you have some experiences that you would like to share or some benefits that you would like to highlight from uh, when uh, when you start. Uh, working with the capability model like this. Yes, thank you, Nick, and, and Lotta. So, so this is actually quite simple, but really interesting uh, way of of, uh, of getting some uh, good grip of your current status uh, uh, in your organization. And uh, and uh, uh, what I what we typically ask, uh, where is your your uh, your your weak points at, at the moment, and where where are your 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 strength points at, at the same time, and um, and it's really interesting also to see how the people who are let's say uh, on the on the uh, operational level how they uh, see it uh, in the same way or differently with the with the management, and uh, and and then we also ask uh, where do you think that we we should focus on in in the future should should that's giving another gap uh, between the current state and, and the future state as well. So it's 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 really simple way of, of doing uh, uh, a very powerful analysis. So you can do this in your organization, let's say in uh, in, 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 in 30 minutes, and, and, and you will get the results uh, within another 30 minutes. And, uh, and, and then you get, then you pretty much get your roadmap for the next, uh, let's say six months uh, implementation of the of the model and, and, and improving your capabilities. And then like, uh, like Nick said, it's important to understand, of course, what, uh, what impacts where, so where actually the flows go, like you have uh, here also yeah. on the capability model, you have uh, the yeah. strategy to plans flow and the plans to capabilities, etc. So it's important to know where in that flow there are the hiccups if we think about, for example, realizing the business value. From, uh, from our development work. Yeah, and over here we quite often talk about the lift shift, uh, uh, shift left uh, uh, <laughs> over here in, with this uh, model. So, so it means that uh, if if you think um, your 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 focus and and maybe your headcount as well, uh, in in many cases the shift left means that uh, uh, you should put more focus uh, on the, on the on the demand and working with the business. Uh, and uh, and less maybe on the operational uh, rely on, uh, on on service providers on on that area, so so that's another area of of thinking by using this framework. Thank you, thank you, Johan and Nick. Uh, was there still something still something Nick that you want to add before we start uh, looking into the flexibility and how the BT standard actually then allows it? So I think there's, there's one more slide, which is just the, obviously we talked about having tools and having done these things before. So um, I think there is a, there is, there is a, there is a, a tried and tested process that the forum has used. And I think my, you have talked about some of the aspects of that. I guess one of the things that occurred to me during that previous discussion as well was it's super useful to have different viewpoints. So how do the business see you? How do different business units see you? How do how do different parts of your IT function see the same problem? Um, because the more viewpoints you take, the uh, more balanced an answer you'll have. So that's typically the the sort of approach we like to take, which is to um, to faci a facilitate the discussion to normalise. Okay, you guys thought it was really good, and you guys thought it wasn't really good. Where where are we really? And then also. Um, Take that in sprints um, with different parts of the organisation, perhaps, and 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 that's the bit that's the knowledge then that you can then use to drive your planning, as as you have said, and it can be pretty rapid. Um, and I would, we, I think, we would always advocate this is a this is a fairly short activity. 
um, because the real work is in driving, driving the improvements and driving the driving the plan that comes out of this. So uh, I think that's where I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Nick. That was a very good uh, fast dive into the maturity assessment. And of course, like said, all this is available in the managebt.org website. So any organization can uh, uh, proceed uh, individually and uh, do it or autonomously and, and do it with themselves. But then, of course, it is possible to ask for help from the implementation partners to have it done in a structured way and, and get the resourcing perhaps that that might be scarce in your or, or own organization so that is also a possible approach but then uh, in the questionnaire there uh, it was highlighted that uh, uh, it was the backlog and the prioritization and then the value business value realization that that came up as the most uh, um, complicated areas or perhaps the areas most in need of improvement so then, Ayla Pohila, warm welcome to you. Good that you could join us this afternoon to discuss about the structured flexibility in terms of BD standard and how that enables it. Good to have you here. Thank you, Lotta. Um, just a couple of words um, about why I'm talking about this topic. Um, so my uh, personal professional responsibility with the PT Forum lies in further developing the demand and development areas of PT standard. So I'm involved in, in developing the PT standard um, knowledge articles in, in uh, online version, but as well as working with the extensions. And we've done quite extensive updates to them during the last couple of years. Um, I'm not just a theoretical person. So on, on my professional life, in my day to day work, I mostly work with clients, helping them to implement PT standard or I'm actually running development initiatives, whether that is in uh, project mode or whether that's in agile mode. So I'm pretty much hands-on in doing this in practice um, day to day. And today I actually have a question for you guys. Um, what do you think? Do you still run projects or are the projects dead? Ooh, this looks like we need to, need to ask it from the participants again. So. How is it? Are we, do we still run projects in the sense that we used to and how we traditionally understand them? Or um, is it more complex to, to define what, what is a project or are all the different areas clearly defined? Let's see, the vote is open now and then, uh, then our moderator will display the results shortly. What do you think, Ayla? Do you think the projects are dead? Um, I don't want to lead the people in answering it, but <laughs> I always think that there is a right tool for everything. So, so the traditional project world also has its uses and functions even today. Okay. All right. So it's it's, it looks even like pretty even. Yeah. This um, is actually interesting. That is. Um, so, but the majority is, is leaning towards definitely running the projects with clear start and end. Um, but there are some difficulties doing the, the duration, scope and budget, which is understandable. And hopefully um, what we talk about today about the flexible structure, structured approach will help you a little bit, like adjusting the covenants in a way that, that you still have the transparency, the visibility in what you're doing, uh, but you, still have the flexibility to react to different changes because the market is changing constantly and you need to react to those changes. And that's probably one of the core reasons why it is more and more difficult um, to define the duration and scope because, you know, like the COVID happened about a year ago and it all hit us all with a surprise and you needed to react to that. Um, but there is also tendency towards, towards going more and more towards agile and towards agile teams and continuous development. So that's an understandable approach also that not all organizations necessarily are using projects at the moment. But let's see what, we, what the PT standard has to say about this. So we've uh, mentioned in this webinar actually already a couple of times this end-to-end -end flow. And this is a really um, a big picture of, of that end-to-end -end flow. It, describes all um, the different paths really that you can take from strategic idea uh, from the demand side into actually something that is, is running um, 
as a service for you and it's providing value for your operations. Um, and in the between there, there are really two main options for um, doing your development. There is the traditional gate-based development as well as the sprint-based development. So based on your needs, you can choose pretty much either one of these. Um, but it's, it's, it becomes a little bit more complex than that. Um, so it's, it's not either or a choice. Um, there is also such a concept as an, an agile project. So if on the left hand side, we have this continual incremental development, we have dedicated capacity teams, it's churning out constantly new releases and thus um, releasing value to your organization. Um, and on the right side, you have that traditional gate based sequential approach um, that releases something as a big bang towards the end. It has a project organization um, and it's existent for a certain period of time. Uh, somewhere there in between, there are different variations and Agile project is, is one of them. So you can still go through the, the gate-based approaches, but you do and do the project organization, but you do your development phase, for instance, in a sprint mode um, and use only the high level gates. So this is, this is one of the aspects of that, that flexibility that PT standard offers that you also have that opportunity to do Agile projects. I'm going to introduce a little bit about the project model um, and what it actually offers. Um, so project model defines um, essentially phases and stages. Um, that extension describes um, what happens in each phase, what happens before the actual project starts, during the planning stages, during the development stages and into develop deployment and then what happens after the project. Um, it identifies um, the roles and responsibilities related to it and the key activities that you should do in your each um, stage. Uh, but it also describes the gates um, and the checklists and the deliverables related to each of those gates. What, what is fantastic about um, this model, and this is actually why we have also, also used the honeycombs to describe this model, is that it is not just the traditional waterfall, um, one phase, and then you go to a next one, but you can use this and combine it in quite innovative ways. So you can, um, you can do projects that are not linear. You, you may start, um, do a study and planning phase, um, do a bit of a concepting and design what the solution might look like. And based on that, you reiterate your plans um, constantly before you come up with the solution that you actually want to develop further. And you may even reiterate in the development validation phases and release continuously. But it also works um, just as well with big programs uh, where you have a big um, pre-study for your, your program where you decide what we are going to do, how we're going to do this. And then it fans out into different um, projects or flows, which are either small or are, are bigger ones. And depending on the size and the complexity of your projects, um, in the early stages, you can choose just to go through the minimal portfolio gates where, where you uh, provide transparency to your portfolio and, and the bare minimum of your governance steps, or you can do um, extensive enterprise uh, project and choose to use all of the gates. It depends on really what you need in your project, but the model offers you kind of the overall um, guidelines on either go big or go small or something in between. And Agile fits into this setup quite nicely. So how does the, uh, the governance actually work? And, and Juha showed in, in his speech in the beginning, those different governance levels, the picture uh, with the enterprise level, the value stream level, and then the end-to-end -end flow level. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on, on the end-to-end -end flow level. Um, so uh, the key governance um, points are really um, shown in this picture. So there is a typical decision related to, to authorizing the flow. We can get started whichever method we choose. Uh, we can start this um, and approve the initiative that is, is going to go on. And the same structures can be used um, to use whichever development mode you choose, whether you are going into the gate-based, uh, whether that's tra uh, traditional or whether it's agile, or you can use um, that in the product team setup where you have continuously 
um, developing and delivering agile teams. The key for this model is, is really the minimum viable governance and the role-based governance uh, that you have mentioned. So there are some key roles involved um, in directing the development and doing the decision making. And one of the key roles involved is, is, of course, the business ownership and the product ownership. So they are very much on the driver's seat doing the decisions, what needs to be developed when, when the developers are actually deciding on how that is that will be developed. And as long as you are functioning within the mandate that the value stream has given to you, you have the budgeting, you have the resourcing and so on, it is okay just to continue. And in these specific control points, um, you provide visibility to the portfolio. This is of course um, quite familiar if you are working with, you have been working with uh, project models and you have been working with portfolio steering before you understand the gates and the, those uh, points where you typically would go for a gate decision and provide reporting and such. But how does this actually work if you, you're functioning in an agile setting? Um, if you have a agile team um, that is doing, does that actually fit into the governance structure that would come from the typical uh, portfolio setup? So over here, we have a picture that you probably re recognize from, from agile world, those very familiar infinity loops that are related to design validate uh, release, uh, gather feedback, and go back to the uh, design validate release loop. Uh, before that, you would typically have a analyze, uh, prioritize type of loop that feeds into the um, um, design, develop, and, and validate loops. Um, if we um, take a look at the governance points related to this, so you can start that agile team and the agile team work just the, in the same way as you would do a investment decision on your project. You decide um, that you are, you're going to invest in whatever service or product uh, you are doing. Um, that team decision is, is approved. You're ap approving the resources for this development. And then uh, later on, as you clarify the vision um, for the team, the team composition, um, that's another um, governance point, approving the development initiative. And then as you go forward, um, every sprint, every, every quarterly increment, however you decide to, to build your cadence, um, that sprint decision, that roadmap decision that you do, uh, this is what, what we are committing to for the next two weeks or whether it's for next three months, that's another governance point where you provide visibility for your portfolio. This is our roadmap, this is what we're doing, this is what we're delivering. Um, and as the team releases, it goes through certain checkpoints that would be familiar with, with your CAP procedures, but just much more lighter, uh, considering that probably this strategic risk is a lot less than what with the big bang release, because you are doing a bigger changes compared to the smaller changes. And as, as they are taken into use, gradually, one by one, uh, the, the final development is, is approved. So everything kind of happens in the same way as it would in your project world um, with the kind of points, control points that are very similar to gates. It's just more lightweight and more suitable um, for this fast development. So you don't need to go through all the, the bridges and hoops that you would build for a bigger um, application releases, for instance. Um, but you do it, you still do the same checks and balances, uh, but it might be self checks and balances instead of, of forums. All right. I think also um, you have mentioned this, this earlier on um, the compliance between PT standard and, and safe. So it really is when you, when you start building up from your um, agile teams that you can use safe as an, um, a scaling option. Uh, PT standard builds on, on top of that. It provides more um, choices to execute your strategy and kind of run your business and it takes into consideration aspects that safe necessarily doesn't do, but they are, they are compliant with each other. So if you choose to run um, a lot of agile development, um, safe is a very good choice to, to scale your development up from those one or two teams focusing on, on certain independent products. 
Um, and in the end, I, I want to also mention what are the kind of the extensions under the hood of, of PT standards. So what you have mentioned as the expert level material related to this. So PINC standard online uh, offers the, the high level version, but there is of course the adaptable project model that is, is leaning towards the, the more traditional project models, offers you the gates, offers you the description of the stages, the checklists between um, different stages and at, at, at the gates, all the tools and templates related to that, uh, which you can then use to run your big projects your middle-sized project, all your agile projects, and so on. Um, on. On the side of that, there is the agile handbook that will help you with, with your agile development initiatives, getting um, started with your agile and then understanding how you would do that within your organization if you are coming from that project background. Uh, business technology governance um, update has also been added as a as an article into the site, and it describes more in detail how you um, implement these governance structures within PT standard to specifically run your demand and development and, and run. And of course, like we have mentioned so many times, the roles and responsibilities kind of cover the entire PT standard, but help you to really understand the roles related to that role-based governance, which are the key roles that would um, be running the end-to-end -end flows. Thank you, Aylan. That was a very, very, very good uh, deep dive into this area. And uh, one of the attendees actually uh, uh, rose up this term, a wagile, which is not very, of course, admirative, perhaps, uh, towards combining this uh, <laughs> structure and flexibility. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's a nice term. I, I purposefully um, steered away from the term waterfall, um, yeah. because I think if if I if I'm asked whether the the waterfall is dead, I think it is. I don't think it ever actually even lived. Um, but there are benefits to the um, to the traditional sequential approach, understanding the stages, understanding the gauge. Um, but we also need to admit that not all projects are the same. So one model doesn't serve all projects. It, it does need that adaptability. I'm, I'm curious to ask still, um, taking back to Nick Russell's presentation in the beginning and uh, regarding that uh, maturity assessment, and there we asked our attendees where they see currently in their organizations the biggest need for development. And uh, one of the areas was this uh, backlog and prioritization. prioritization. And uh, how do you see that, uh, that the BT standard, does it provide some kind of insight or tools, or is there something that you could uh, uh, give as a, as a tool or, or insight for our participants yeah. today regarding that? Yeah, it is. It, I find that also in, in, um, when I talk with the, with the clients that the, the prioritization is, is really um, tough. And if the prioritization is tough, then the business value realization will become even more tough because that's that's where where it kind of leads. Um, and the VT standard offers, um, if you look at what it, how it kind of distinguishes between different types of um, kind of sources of demand that you you have different ways of handling things. Um, so it pro provides you with tool sets on how you what kind of description and, and value statement you would need for a, a bigger investment, bigger projects, um, such as business cases, but also tools for you to, to have that dialogue uh, within a product owner and, and an agile team that how do we do the decision making and prioritization um, in this setting, which is much, much smaller compared to big investment decisions. Um, and how you prioritize that. But it is, um, it is very much the same principle behind all of it. So value and the business should drive the principle, um, the prioritization. And it's a matter of how you balance that with, with the resourcing that you have available for your development. Good, thank you. So maybe a good idea after this session that if you voted uh, that as one of the areas in most need of development to navigate to managebt.org and just uh, click that tile open and start with uh, having the read of uh, what is suggested there and then then of course uh, look uh, look into more detail what to how to approach it and develop it so that then you ensure the flow 
all the way to the value uh, realization. Absolutely. But thank you, Ella, so much for making it with us this afternoon. I think uh, we will uh, say thank you and bye bye, and then uh, we will move forward to uh, to the next presentation. And uh, I would want to warmly welcome uh, John Butterworth from uh, King's College London. What a magnificent view you have displayed there, John. Can you hear me, John? Maybe you are muted still. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, uh, now it's perfect. Now I can see you and I can okay. hear you. Okay, yes, uh, it's funny. I did try and unmute before. So obviously uh, decided to be temperamental. Yes, but this is a great view, isn't it? <laughs> it is a great view. Wow, and the weather there as well. So you have in this picture, you have a uh, Dublin's weather, but not the not the London's weather, if I yeah. understand correctly. And actually, the sun <laughs> is just beginning to shine now. I'm speaking oh. from, from Cornwall, uh, so it's very nice okay. to have a bit of sun there. Okay, nice. So you have traveled out there. Yeah, well, I'm normally based um, there. So um, we have the King's Service Center operating out of Cornwall. Um, so we started doing that about five... Ooh, ooh. Do you know, it's amazing how fast time goes. It, we must have started it something like seven, six, seven years ago um, with just putting the service desk out there really. But now we've got a full um, support for IT out there and other functions too. So knocking on for a couple of hundred people um, working out of Cornwall uh, and the overall IT team is, you know, is in the 350 plus. Um, so, but the good thing is, you know, we operate as one team. And that's really a mantra that you'll see that we're sort of going to uh, adopt here as, as we run through. So what I'm showing you here is, is a slide where the more and more we've um, worked on what we're doing in IT and BTS and services, um, the more we see that uh, it's about the overall sort of service to the university and the principles in the framework apply way beyond you know just the IT team supporting the business so um, we have this little mantra one team cross-functional partnering to plan build and run university services and this holds good whether it's an IT uh, service or whether it's a, an estates one um, one that doesn't use any IT support at all, although that's very rare these days. Um, but we're trying to have everyone focused on, you know, what's the university there for? Um, and so you was mentioning, you know, the value streams earlier. And so the three uh, ones for us are education, students, research, researchers and service. And then you've got these gray verticals, which kind of represent um, the different teams, one of which might be the IT team and other is the estates and facilities and so on, um, all of which have a part to play in supporting the, uh, the student, the researcher or service to the world. Now, one of the concepts in uh, BT standard is the idea of the service portfolio steering group and at King's, um, we've called those our FPG and the SPSG. Now the FPG is the functional planning group. So that's the higher level things like education, things like research. And they then have a number of topics of interest below. So in education land, you might have timetabling, uh, student welfare as an area of concern. So that's where people can come together in their focused communities. So each FBG will have one or more SPSGs supporting it. And then at the bottom, you can see right from digital environment, which is IT on the left through to strategy and transformation, that same structure. Uh, the thing that we're trying to work with at King's is actually trying to um, do you know, cross portfolio prioritization, which came up as the, uh, the number one concern in the poll earlier, um, because you can work out within education, within research, within health and safety, what you want to do, but does um, are all the parts heading in the same direction. So we're trying to have a common approach to portfolio planning, delivery and running our services. And you'll recognize the, 
um, logo there at, from request release uh, and use services as being straight out of um, BTS. So that's something that's landing quite well uh, in the university. And from an IT point of view, we're telling people that what are we here to help you do, to innovate, to build, to run, and make sure we do it well. So we're supporting all of those areas. And to begin to start a cross portfolio prioritization, we do have a view of what are the key services. So there's that little, uh, uh, almost looks like a target or, or a radar screen in the middle. And that shows the spread of projects or product work based work if we have a group of agile things together in the different um, functional planning groups. Um, and all of this applies right across the uh, capability model. And what we're doing, um, because it takes time, as Nick Russell was saying, to um, adopt and implement um, the approach, we have um, one of our own SPSGs is, is called Strategy to Operate. And so that's how we as, as a as a management team adopt different aspects of the model. And this is our Microsoft Teams planner board. So this is a screenshot from a couple of weeks ago where you'll see that we've basically laid out our tasks according to um, the BTS model. And you can see pictures of who's the lead on each of those. Yeah. Um, so that's just one way in which um, you might like to uh, copy that, but we're meeting on a, um, every other week uh, with the exec and um, sen senior stakeholders across the university to drive some of those things forward. So one of the things that we're trying to get out is an understanding of what's our operating model, which is this little briefcase here. Um, BT capability model, the BT standard is our umbrella, if you like, under which everything else comes together. And then in the middle, particularly in the university sector, so as Nick mentioned, we have meetings at uh, USIZA and Rugged and other um, university gatherings where we are building um, sector level knowledges, but we're also adopting the other frameworks. You can see a picture of SAFE there, which is one of those that we um, looked at in the previous presentation, um, but also we're very much an ITIL shop. So those are, uh, frameworks which BTS isn't trying to um, copy, but ones which are, uh, what's, the, what's the word, um, aligned with BTS. So that's the detail below the framework that one might like to use. And then what we're calling our COM extension, things operating model extension, are those things which we do differently, perhaps to the, all of those frameworks, or where there are gaps where we need to define some things. So we're in the process of putting together a SharePoint site, um, an intranet, so that we can share this information right across the university so that they'll be able to click in there. So this is a screen of that in progress. And we'll have links to um, the standard framework and the uh, materials that have been shared with us as, as a partner, links to other bodies of knowledge, um, presentations on uh, things that we've done in the sector and so on. Um, we're, we haven't launched it yet, but when we do so, one of the key things that we wanted to do was to um, signal our move into Agile. And we are going to be um, adopting the agile ways of working and very much using um, off the shelf BTS to do this. So we're trialing a continual improvement approach with our digital team. Um, it works well for them. They're all, they've already been working in a fairly agile manner. And we've had our second sort of a quarterly review with those guys. So this is good um, because they're a very focused team doing all of their work really in a digital way and we hope to be able to uh, begin to share that practice with other teams. Um, I think it's um, the previous presenter said you know there are horses for courses you choose the right tools um, 
and yes there never really was a such a thing as a pure waterfall but we will have a blended environment where some people would deliver what we would call traditional projects and some will be doing it in an agile way and we're also piloting an agile project so we're going to again be doing that in our crm team so we've chosen a, an area or a team who already understand um, agile techniques and we intend to again just share um, the benefits the experience with other teams there and again we're adopting the bts templates there um, there's something we had which we call the t4 t for template how it, um, a lot of imagination to come up with that one wasn't that's it? fantastic <laughs> <laughs> that's the finance uh, template so that one remains um, so good news so for us we we are adopting um, the agile way of working but very much as i say off the shelf from bts on the on the right hand side waterfall in inverted commas continues um, but we have declared our intention to adopt the bts templates um, as soon as we reasonably can um, and they have a weekly sort of project review board cycle that nick leak the cio chairs but on the agile side we come back together um, at a senior level really for a quarterly steering view <clears throat> the other area where we're um, moving forward really is in our understanding of uh, the roles you've got obviously four key um, could, could we sorry john could we pause here just a little bit yes i'm curious to ask in the, if you go one slide back and uh, uh, here in the middle, there is the picture of the standard uh, operating model from the business technology standard, and then uh, the value streams at the background. So how have you approached those value streams? I believe that you had them uh, in some of the first slides. So how did you ap approach and go about defining what are the value streams for, uh, for King's College London? Yeah, I think the history of that, even before we came across um, BT standard, is we were beginning to have the, the concept of uh, service interest groups, uh, mm -hmm. whereby people were connecting together around uh, marketing or education, libraries and collections, um, the, the sort of the groups which would form um, our delivery uh, portfolio. So what we've been doing a lot since is beginning to look at um, the value chains or the business processes that sit um, in those areas. So it's quite interesting that um, probably eight years ago, we identified um, a number of uh, functional areas, which were, yeah, which really are all the ones represented here in the the red, the green, the blue, and then all of the greys. And whilst those groupings have changed their names, such as people, and you can see people and organisation in the middle of the bottom there, um, we used to call it HR. Um, now we just call it people and organizations. So some of these things have sort of changed names. One or two have come and gone, um, but it's very noticeable that it's the same um, high level groupings uh, that fit together. We also created something called the King's Activity Model where we started to decompose the key processes or value streams that we were following there and interestingly when we go back to the sort of the sector model um i haven't drawn a picture of it in here but in here you've got things like ooh, go back uh, the core it and um usizer models where they've come up with um, models which explain if you like what goes on in a university and those are fairly much the same whichever um, university you go to so having those sort of common frameworks there works quite well when laid aside or laid against the bts model does that help yes yes it does thank you then i was still thinking how um how has that been in terms of uh, governance then has it required a, a big change in terms of governance as well, uh, defining these uh, value streams? Yeah, I mean, um, 
yes and no, and it's and it's a journey. Um, we have what we would call the functional lead from an area chairing the, what we're calling the functional planning group. So if it's the people and organizational one, then um, Brent Dempster, our director of HR, uh, would be leading that one. When we're looking at the estates and facilities grouping, then Nick O'Donnell, our director of estates and facilities, leads that one. Uh, Nick Leak, our CIO, leads the IT one, for, for example. And each of those brings together the key um, stakeholders from the IT solutions and services side with um, the people in terms of the BTS model who would be the business information owners or uh, you know the business process representatives so people from both sides of the community if you like the biggest one of the challenges that we've not quite worked out yet is education um, in university still has, for example, behind it, nine different academic faculties. Um, and they are, can operate with a fair degree of autonomy too. So getting all the right people together around the table is, is challenging. But when we took our um, roadmap to um, the university for the annual planning round, we used this um, radar type screen in the middle, which was showing these are all the things um, that uh, people in the different uh, value streams are wanting to do. Um, that amounts to quite a lot of money uh, and the university will be taking a view of whether or not it can afford all of that or what its priority um, would be. Uh, but at least from this, we we're able to lay before them a picture of what people are asking um, the IT team to help them with. Okay. Good. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> so roles. Yeah, it's really important to understand your roles. Who does what, and how do they fit across the capability model? Um, and it's been very helpful for us to use that to inform our strategy to sort of develop our IT talent. So we're starting to use those roles to create um, indicative IT career paths. Um, I think nowadays you don't, you can't be too definitive about what the career path is because people will take many, many ways through horizontal moves and vertical moves to build their career. But we use well, one of the things that we've created is a graduate and apprenticeship uh, program at King's. And in the bottom half of this slide, we're just uh, signaling um, where people have come and gained experience in IT and, and grown. So that's been useful. Um, but coming back to the value streams, um, we were thinking before about the IT people, what about the business people? And we have a piece of work underway at the minute to try and translate, if you like, into King's language, uh, the BTS definition of roles to how it works within King's and to try and develop the business view of the roles, which typically are in the blue area or, or in the red area for, for demand. Um, so that's work that's going on now. So in terms of the services that, you, that we offer um, in education, the key external services are to get things like a degree. In research, you're gonna deliver research. And there, then there are a number of uh, things that you do to make that possible, such as get yourself some students that you can teach, uh, timetable when things are gonna happen, identify what your research opportunities are and, and manage your grants. To support that, uh, a number of people have got different uh, services to make it all happen. Um, but who is doing what? What are the roles? So we have a piece of work underway where we're trying to define our service offerings and then begin to create a view, BT style, of what the roles are. Um, and so we have the idea of a professional services one team, and uh, this 
is a starting view of where we've got to in terms of some of those um, business side roles that exist. And if we can understand and build this view, it makes it a lot easier for people outside of IT to engage with us and engage with the standard. So in the health and safety area, you've got people who look after training and certification, people who look after safety. This view at the minute is still a little bit functional, but it's a good starting point for us to develop um, the roles view um, outside of the uh, technology areas. Um, and what we're hoping to do is to flesh out um, BT style, what their responsibilities are, what they do. Um, the Sophia thing may not um, apply outside of the IT roles. We're not sure about that yet. Our intention is that we'll keep the definitions at a reasonably higher level and close to BTS, sort of vanilla as possible, but it will be tuned to Kings. And part of the way we're doing this is, is going through what BTS has said, the enterprise architect does, the financial manager does, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the right, trying to work out who's the King's equivalent. So some of them are easier than others. So business analyst tends to be business analyst. Um, the financial manager for us clearly is someone we call our finance business partner, but there are actually aspects of the financial management that also happen uh, within my team, for example. But by laying it all out uh, on a table like this, we're hoping that we can get key stakeholders to agree um, who does what, but we know that there will be some gaps too. And as we get those, um, we'll share with, with the BT Forum what we're finding, um, because there are things there that maybe you'll want to take back into the standard. So that's kind of uh, an update on where we are at King's in applying um, BTS today. So key things are trying to really focus at a high level on the, on the value delivered to um, the student, the researcher, to, to the world in terms of the service that we do. And that's quite important because that means um, when we're talking to the academics, when we're talking to other professional service leaders, um, it's not as if we're interested in IT for IT's sake, we're interested in uh, the outcomes that the university wants to deliver. Uh, and that's something that we will find it all easier within the university to agree upon. Um, but I'm quite excited really about how BTS helps us with that. Um, one team cross-functional partnering um, mantra that is really becoming part of the um, language in our senior management team, which sits you know, above the IT team. So there you are. I don't know if anyone has any particular uh, questions, but I hope that that has been a helpful update for people. That's definitely very interesting. I wanted to ask still, John, now that you've been uh, traveling this journey and uh, um, getting to know the business technology standard and doing these uh, development initiatives or around uh, the roles and the governance and uh, uh, value streams. Now, if you look back uh, one or two years from here, what would you highlight as uh, some of the most important steps that have actually caused a positive change or something or opened up your thinking or or something what would what would come to your mind mm. well I, I think actually having um the latest version of bts you know 4.5 4 4.5.1 is is really um helpful um beginning to have a sort of a common language that people can use our um, management information uh, aligns with the service area. So um, I don't have a slide on this to hand, but um, we know uh, whether it's our service catalog or whether it's um, service performance, mm -hmm. pretty much everything we're doing is tr we're trying to make it um, available to people through the lenses of those functional and service um, product strategy groups. So 
all, all of the catalog ideas come together in that same place, all of the plans for the projects and for the service improvements, which really is the backlog for the agile work, um, is all being seen in that one place. So I think getting some of the, the, um, the definitions clear, uh, going through all of the uh, catalog that we've got and aligning it properly to the right functions, to the right services, um, that's been one of the, um, the big step forwards um, that we've seen at King's, I would say. So would you say like a positive uh, structure for, for, for all of these? Yeah, absolutely. And then the common language. Yeah. Yes, that sounds, that sounds really great. So John, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon and maybe re we release you at this point to enjoy the uh, rays of sun if they are still present. <laughs> Looks like they're still there. <laughs> and uh, then, then um, uh, so thank you John and thank you King's College London. Thank, it's thanks, a everyone. great thing to have you as a development partner for the Business Technology Forum. And then next up, uh, we will uh, still dive deeper into the Agile area. And uh, we have Elena Pirinen from Aalto University. Welcome, Elena. Thank you. Thank you. So nice that you could join us. Are you joining from uh, from Espo or Helsinki? Or, I'm, I'm or actually Michigan? joining from Inko, at Inko. So it's in the south of Finland. And it's very, very rainy today here. So. But you have some kind of artificial sun there because I can see the sun rays uh, on your on your face there. So yeah, yeah, so it yes. Looks, it looks like very sunny there. <laughs> uh, trying everything we can. Good, but you are working tightly with uh, with projects uh, at all yes. the university and. Uh, and today you have joined us here to, to share um, some examples of agile project practices and, uh, and uh, how you have approached them in Alba and what kind of learnings you have from there. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we, we, we in Aalto, as you said before also, we, we did this kind of maturity assessment with BTS and we found out one of the major findings was that we, we, our business value realization is too slow, our projects take too much time and that's why we started adding some agile elements into our project. But first I could show you, I didn't know how familiar you are with the Aalto University. So we are, we are a big university in Finland. We have six schools, we have 12,000 students, 4,000 personnel, and we operate in Espo area in Finland. And next I had a, a, a short slide about me. So I, I work in IT services, as I noticed that the also, other presenters here are from the IT, uh, IT department, and that's where the, this kind of thinking is, is also in Aalto, this kind of adding agile things is, is trying, to, trying to fly from, from, the, from the IT services. That's where the magic happens. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we, we try to serve our whole of university to succeed. Good. Yeah. And uh, so in the next slide, I will show you how our, our, our current portfolio model or our current project model is very, uh, is very it's a gate-based model. It's in the, in the top of this slide. And uh, typically our projects take a very, very long time. They take months or even years. And that's why here in the bottom of this slide, we started to add some agile elements into our project world, so that in each of these phases, pre-study, plan, implement, or rollout, there can be agile elements in each of these phases, and still we can have these gate decisions at the same time. And my uh, example uh, here in the next slide will be a very practical example of how we actually added these uh, agile elements into uh, three uh, projects. Uh, Alto procured, uh, pro uh, acquired uh, as probably procurement a very uh, large service platform and it consists of large projects. And, and there we, we decided that uh, now we cannot wait for years to get some value to the to actually to Alto and, and we will try these agile, agile things. 
And here in the next slide, we can see how uh, we, we started to try this in the, in the rollout phase. So all of these uh, uh, applying for the, for the money and applying for resources and a big level scope, all of these things were done before we started to add agile elements. And so here what we did was that uh, before the first release went into production, then we moved from this like sequence, we moved into more agile way and added uh, sprints and added releases. And now we will stay here in this rollout phase and release more releases uh, uh, until the high level project scope will be uh, uh, will be reached and in the next slide i show you how this is in practice going so here on the left hand side we have our product backlog which is mostly user stories they are in jira and before each sprint we do the normal sprint planning and we take our backlog backlog items to the sprint backlog it's also in the tool is Jira here. And we have the four week sprints where uh, three weeks is actually development. And one week is always uh, research for uh, testing for user acceptance testing. And then we will release always the, the, the increment. So, so basically once a month, we always release something useful for the users. And as in Scrum model, we have the sprint review after the sprint and also sprint retrospective. And then we start planning the next sprint. Uh, as, as also discussed in this meeting uh, before, uh, we have the, all the time we have the project organization. So we, we haven't actually implemented any agile roles in that way. Uh, so we are now trying that, 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 that the project organization will do all of this. And in the next slide, I will dive even deeper. So here is uh, one example of a release pattern, how this works. So uh, first three weeks uh, implementing and then uh, integration testing. And after three weeks, there is the user acceptance testing and then the deployment. How large a project team did you have uh, in this uh, attending this uh, release pattern here? Uh, we, we do have uh, also internal people, we have uh, about uh, three to four persons, and then we have a service provider from outside of Alto, who is then uh, who is doing the implementation, the actual actual implementation, and the service provider team is approximately four persons. Okay, and, and did the team have uh, previous experience in running a project in an agile manner? That's a very good question, yes. So uh, uh, the service provider was very used to, very used to the agile way of working, but here in Aalto, IT, we knew something about agile way of working and the, the, the people from other units of uh, Aalto, for example, learning services, they, they hadn't even heard of, of agile before. So this is like really trying out in the, how, how can this work? But that sounds like a real uh, real life uh, experience then, because that can often be the case that we have perhaps heard of it, but then we don't really know what it is about. Yes, exactly. So we started that now it's the time to, to, to start learning and start trying. Yes, that's good. That's, a, that's the courageous way to do it. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's, it has been... Uh, then in the, my last slide will be a bit of lessons learned, but but first I will have our next slide is also very practical hands on uh, how what's important in this uh, releasing this uh, once a month something. So we need to have a clear scope. What are we actually releasing? Then we do have to have these validation steps that uh, that how when is this actually ready, and and when can the user actually test. And, and there we found out that those user stories are very good basis for the test cases as well. This is something that we have learned during the during this uh, trip during this trip that we have tried. And then my last slide is uh, about the lessons learned. So we have now 
been on this journey for 11 months. And I, I asked from the project manager, I asked also from the project team that what, what they think about this, trying these outside elements. And they liked the, the fail fast that, 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 that we try something in four weeks, uh, four weeks release. And then we, then we um, if it's not exactly what the user wanted, then we have the next four weeks uh, where we can uh, again, try something to do something better. They liked, liked Jira as a tool for this backlog and sprint planning. And they liked the visibility uh, to how project is actually proceeding, especially the project manager like this one, that, that, that is not uh, some huge task list, Excel or something that's difficult to know. Now we know each month where we are. Then uh, on the minus side, maybe there was this that the, the goal is maybe the high level goal is decided and clear, but then the, but where are we actually going in each four weeks time? It's, it's difficult. It's maybe not always clear to everybody. And then this don't forget documentation uh, uh, I put here because they said that it's quite often that the people may be saying that now we are all agile, we don't need to document anything. And it's not true. The documentation is still needed just as in the normal gate-based sequence uh, projects. And then uh, here it was frustrating to wait. So we still have to wait for different approvals. We are a big organization. We have a lot of groups that uh, need to give their approvals to whatever things. And it, things don't move as fast as, as we would have liked. So sometimes something can take more than four weeks because we are waiting for this, just for this approval. I think, I think here we come uh, quite nicely to the, to the beginning and what the Yuka yes. was presenting right in the beginning about the minimum viable governance. So if we don't have the governance structures in place that support uh, flexibility, then, then we will end up perhaps uh, trying to tackle those uh, during the project. Exactly. Yes, that's what I was also. Uh, I, I was also very pleased to see that in the beginning of this meeting that that was exactly where we have been like uh, stumbling on here at Alto University. Yes. And also then this last one was that uh, although we are agile, uh, we need to be systematic. So this was also exactly what VTS is talking about, that, that, that we need to have the systematic approach uh, to think how we actually do things. Uh, there are so many needs as always there are in, in big organizations and there are so many points of view and things. So we need to have this, although agile doesn't mean that we can do anything whatever time whoever wants to so we need to have this systematic approach what it actually means and that this is also where bts has been useful to us uh, in that way so that was my my very hands on presentation of what we have tried here at alto university <laughs> that was so good and would you would you do it again like this elena Yes, we will continue. We will we definitely will continue. continue and we will take new projects to try, for example, in the in the other phases of the projects that how could this agile way of working work, for example, in pre-study. Good. Hey, thank you so much for sharing this very, very concrete example of, uh, of how you have combined uh, or how you how you have brought flexibility and why you did it also to achieve a faster uh, business value realization in, in these uh, lengthy and uh, costly projects. And uh, uh, this is almost the time for us to wrap up. So maybe a few words to conclude here. Um, uh, what we have heard from all the speakers uh, during this afternoon and, uh, and uh, then the business technology standard point of view. So we were talking about the maturity assessment and how it is a good starting point to have a look at the capability model and understand that where in your organization you have the pain points. Then, of course, understanding the big picture, what is the operating model and, uh, and the governance model that you have in place 
And is it such, and are they such that then they enable bringing the flexibility in a structured, uh, consistent and systematic way into your organization? And then from the business technology standard, you will find the tool sets and, uh, and the support material. And also uh, when taking it into use, you have these uh, trainings available. And uh, for example, here, I wanted to bring up like in every Wednesday webinar, we have shared about this training programs that then also uh, introduce the more in-depth extension material into each of these areas. So there is also the one related to the governance uh, topic, the certified PT governance um, model designer. So concluding here, and thank you so much to all the panelists. And uh, thank you all also the attendees who were here with us uh, at this moment. And if you are viewing this by video afterwards. Uh, thank you for watching and I hope that uh, this gave you some uh, inspiring ideas and insights and uh, something positive to, uh, to take into use in, uh, in your work. So uh, see you in uh, managebt.org and I hope that you find a lot of uh, positive support material for your work from there. Now thank you from my behalf and, uh, and uh, see you again in an upcoming uh, webinar next time.